So, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, uh, an online conflict transformation summit, exploring pathways to more regenerative and healthy uh, cultures. Um, uh, I'm Eva Schoenfeld, I'm here in Edinburgh, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome Rosa Zubizareta. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, my guest today. Um, so, Rosa's, Rosa's work is um, huge. It goes uh, uh, through through a whole load of different areas. She's um, looking at collaborative epistemologies, which she will go into a little bit for us, um, and also relational approaches to group facilitation. Um, uh, particularly, I think, uh, dynamic facilitation. But Rose is, Rose is going to bring um, together a whole lot of different uh, areas of, of uh, inspiration that she's found um, supporting that kind of move towards more healthy groups and more healthy cultures. Um, and take it away, Rose. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you to begin with about your journey, um, about how your your you know how you came into this work how what your relationship with conflict where that started and yeah and thanks so much thank you Eva for for organizing this and inviting me to be here and interviewing me on on all this um yeah conflict well for me I feel like my journey started like for so many of us who are in this area right there's a very personal dimension to it um but I, I was born in Peru. My mother is Cuban, and um, my father was the first person in his family to graduate from high school and went on to college and was, you know, a very bright person, did a lot of work. And I think with the best intentions in his heart, he wanted to teach me, uh, we say in Spanish, como defenderme, you know, like how to defend myself in, in, a, in a social way. And so in his understanding, that was through being very verbally skilled and, and you know, this, this whole notion of being able to, to argue and to defend yourself and to justify your position and to build a case for what you believed in and, and all of that. And so I, I felt like I was really taught to do that from a very young age, and it was um, actually quite painful. In, in many ways. And, um, you know, my, and my folks had a very difficult marriage. They, they separated at some point, but anyway, f flash forward to, uh, many years later, I was in my early twenties and, um, driving down the freeway and I turned on the radio and there was a program and I didn't know it initially what it was, but there was a woman who was speaking about very eloquently about the um, the problems in the world and that lead to war. And I realized after a short while, there was an, an announcer who came on and I realized this was a program for Hiroshima Day, right? So they were interviewing these different activists. And this woman spoke really beautifully. And then when her turn was over, this gentleman started speaking. He was another one of the panelists. He said, okay, so now we'll hear from, you know, I forget his name, but Michael so and so. Mm. And this man started speaking, and the first few words out of his mouth is like, hmm, that's interesting. I, I have a very different take on it. And I just noticed that my body just froze, right? Like, I was mm. just like, oh, no, you know, dear universe, dear God, dear goddess, please let's not let's not have a verbal war between these two people who are speaking for peace, right? And then as he continued to speak, it was just, it was a very moving experience because he, he then said, you know, I, I really agreed with you here and I really agreed with you there and there's so much valid. And then there's this point that you said, and you know, I think that's valid. And, you know, I have this other perspective over here, but it was like, it was so... So not what I had feared, right? It was so not this, like, well, let's get into a verbal jousting match, which I, I was just dreading because of, it would have been so 
contradictory to the actual topic, which was how do we create world peace, right? So it, it's an experience that has stayed with me. This was long before I kind of found my path to this field. I was very aware for a long time that we needed to recreate our culture, that we needed to, you know, be part of this great transition towards a sustainable culture on earth. But but everything needs to be reinvented, right? From how we do our energy to how we do our transportation to how we do this to how we do that. And so for a long time I didn't know where in the midst of all that change was mine to work. Um, but eventually many years later I um ended up at a facilitation workshop and I was not um not initially interested in attending at all because my sense of facilitation was that it was about herding cats and it was about um, getting people to color inside the lines. And I'm much more interested in having people color outside the lines. And and I'm an introvert, right? So I, I don't see myself as somebody who can, you know, really manage or steer a group of people anywhere in particular. Uh, but when I uh, a good friend of mine had been to this workshop and really, really wanted me to attend. And so I ended up allowing myself to be persuaded by promises of wonderful collaborative vegetarian dinners in the evening with all these other people he was inviting to come. Because what he really wanted was to have people to talk about this process with. He'd been there once. It was different, unusual. And he just wanted to you know, have others to talk about it with. And in the afternoon of the first day I had such a powerful experience of very different kinds of people arriving at a kind of open-minded curi- and open-hearted curiosity about each other's experience that I was totally blown away and so that was the beginning of me feeling like oh I found it this is this is my my place this is the place where I want to be contributing to this larger turn that needs to happen. And that's led on to, to sort of lots of explorations of Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. How we how we mm-hmm. do things together in a yeah in a productive way. Yeah, right. Shortly after that, um, up to that time I'd I'd had a you know a bit of a checkered career. I worked for a while in bilingual education and I worked for a while uh, doing translations of educational materials from Spanish to English and English to Spanish and you know had done different different sorts of things um but I realized that I wanted to go back to school oh and I'd been very curious about things like diversity work and conflict resolution and Mm -hmm. and so then when I when I stumbled onto this um, this process, I, I realized I wanted to have a much broader picture. So I went back to school for a master's in organization de- development and really began a 20-year process of learning as much as I could about different ways of working with people and working with groups and collaboration and all that, which you know, I've been curious about all this. And I started a little bit of that before already, but it really catalyzed like, okay, this is where I'm going to dive deep and so there are those those kind of things that draw us together and and enable us to work together in new ways and then inevitably at some point it all falls apart and everyone hates each other or everyone hates somebody or you know yeah 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 it's that yeah it's that sort of beautiful dream and then you know I guess everybody goes through this at least once the first time of going oh no but we're all so lovely we all care so much. How come yeah. Yeah. this is so difficult and horrible? Yeah. yeah. And so what was, yeah. you know, it's, it's, what's your, I guess, you know, either either way, take take it from, from you know, when you first sort of um, really got your teeth stuck into that or, or looking back, what you feel like you've kind of been able to distill from. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's so... It's so interesting because as human beings, we we are so creative and brilliant and wonderful and, um, you know, uh, innovative and, and loving and warm-hearted. And we all have places where we get triggered. We all have blind spots. We all have 
old childhood wounds. We all have um, all all of our stuff, right? And uh, you know, sometimes what I what I do, I, I I really I'm still an educator at heart, and what I love to do with groups is really draw out the learning and the knowledge that is already in the group before beginning to build on that. So, you know, um, when I come in and teach communication classes at times to, you know, staff of an organization, I've been doing a lot of work with Waldorf schools recently, et cetera. Uh, one of the things I love to do is to just begin by drawing forth, you know, what do people know already? Like, what do you know about what helps communication? What do you know about what gets in the way of communication? And and, and people know so much, right? But then there's a question of, okay, so then what happens when we get triggered, right? It's like all that knowledge flies out the window or back to our, you know, fight, flight, freeze minds. And so how do we bring ourselves back from that? You know, how do we, how do we, we find our way back to, um, in the, there's a very interesting body of research called polyvagal theory, all this stuff about the brain and the body. And how do we bring ourselves back to what they call in polyvagal, polyvagal theory, the social engagement system, like the place where we are open to connecting with one another, the place where we actually are able to work with different ideas in a creative way, rather than, you know, these are my allies and those are my enemies and I need to fight them and you know, all of that. So that's, that's quite the journey. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so when you're, when you're working in that arena, because I, you know, the, um, the, the, Dynamic facilitation, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. That's specifically around working with conflict situations, isn't it? Or am I well, saying? yeah, I mean, conflict comes in many forms, right? So yeah. conflict sometimes is simmering under the carpet. It's like, oh, no, everything is fine here. And then there's the conflict where it's like, you know, out and flagrant and, and like yeah. that. And we certainly work with both kinds. But I think that the, so I'll I'll get into this a bit later on, but um, I'm just going to say it now because it, it came up now. I think that one of the ideas that I've been finding really important um, is looking at the context or the conflict system, right? So, which is bigger than whatever two parties might be in conflict, right? So it's like, what's the larger purpose here? Like, why do people even want to resolve the conflict? Because sometimes people have a conflict that is simmering for years, and yet there's not the incentive to actually come to the table and address it. So um, what are some of the sources of the conflict? Because a lot of times, one of the things I learned from my work with organizations, a lot of times the conflict can be structural even. It's like you have one department that is charged with one set of tasks, another department that is charged with another set of tasks. They've never coordinated, and so the work that one group does, you know, it doesn't fit with the processes that the other group does. And so there's a lot of personality attributions that start to be made when there's actually these underlying structural issues about how can we design a system where we can work with each other much more efficiently. So that's another part of what's in the conflict system, this whole notion of roles and um, and workflows and and um, you know, maybe maybe I've developed a a grudge against my neighbor because they have a rooster that, you know, wakes me up every morning at five AM and I happen to work night shift. And then that little ongoing irritation then puts both of us in that fight flight thing where things that we otherwise could have handled just start to grow out of proportion. So so part of the question is what is it that brings us together? What is our larger goal here? Why are we even wanting to address this issue? What are the larger um, what are the larger desired outcomes that we're each bringing to the situation? So yeah, conflict is is a part of life, right? Um, and one of the the things that I felt that I really gained from my work in this practice is, a sense of possibility that if we have the opportunity to do 
creative, constructive work with the different perspectives that are all being brought to the soup that is not about getting rid of conflict. It's about having those different perspectives add up to something that is more than the sum of its parts, is actually having increased cohesion, increased creative process, increased understanding, because we've taken the time to really understand and and learn more from all the different voices that initially have been in too small a space and so kind of clashing up against each other. Yeah, and and I guess that's partly why, you know, the the, the phrase is conflict transformation rather than conflict resolution. Yeah, resolution. Yeah. You kind of feel like well, you'll get back to a kind of how it was before. Yeah. Whereas yeah. with transformation, there's a sense that yeah, if we go through that in a really yeah. honest, open way, we'll actually learn stuff um, and we'll change. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and our relationship will change and so you know on the other side of the conflict there's actually like you're in a better situation than you were you've Mm -hmm. you've benefited from Mm -hmm. from going through that process yeah and 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 there's good reason why it can be scary right so when I do workshops I have this little chart I want to show you for a second so it's a It's a polarity exercise chart. And so we have on this side of the page, we have avoiding conflict. And then we have, um, whoops. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry. Um, I just had a momentary mind lapse here. Avoiding conflict. What are the positives of avoiding conflict? And then avoiding conflict. What are the negatives of avoiding conflict? Right. And then engaging in conflict. What are the positives of engaging in conflict? And engaging in conflict, what are the negatives of engaging in conflict, right? And I usually have folks fill this out as a group because we all, hmm, I don't know about all of us, but many of us who work in the field of um, working with conflict are in many different forms, whether we're mediators or consultants or facilitators or, or like that, there there has been a tendency to kind of um, shame people for being conflict avoidant, right? Like, oh, those people who didn't call for or help three months before when it would have been so much easier to help them, but they were so conflict avoidant that, you know, the whole thing has gotten all the way up to this point and now they're finally coming into us for help, right? So, yeah. um, so, I, one of the things I've found really helpful in my own journey of personal growth, because there's the whole inner dimension of conflict as well as interpersonal mm-hmm. one, right? But um, I find it really helpful, these models that um, acknowledge the, the multiplicity within us, right? The many different um, places, energies, you know, kind of inner children of all different ages and, you know, inner young adults, inner teenagers. Um, so internal family systems is this wonderful model that really helps us to work with inner conflict and with external conflicts as well. So I really like to say that there is a conflict avoidant part in each of us. Mm-hmm. And that if we're going to work well with conflict, we really need to get in touch with that conflict avoidant part because it's there for good reason. Mm-hmm. So what are all the good reasons we can think of of why we might want to avoid conflict? Right, so we start there. Mm. Um, you know, people come up with all kinds of things. I'm sure you could think of some. As a, as a very conflict avoidant person, I can, <laughs> I can, I'm, I'm loving this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting conference to be helping with. Um, yeah, then, you know, I know my own tendency and my own fear. Of yeah. Conflict. yeah. And, and you know, I can. So I'm I'm a little bit in love with the idea that yes, no, it can be really good, but I. I What are the good reasons to avoid conflict? What are some really good reasons to avoid conflict? Well, yeah, damage, irreparable damage. We we keep things safe, right? Irreparable. We prevent irreparable damage. We keep things safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, People say, you know, we're able to focus on the work that needs to be done around here. We preserve relationships. We, you know, all of those things. And 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 I really give it quite some time so Mm -hmm. that people so that we really get that there is a part of us 
that really wants to preserve the relationships we have with people around us, that would much rather brush something small under the table because it could be risky and it could divert us and we just want, you know. But then once we have this one chart really well filled with very solidly grounded, good reasons to avoid conflict, then we start looking at, well, what are the downsides of it? If we avoid conflict for too long, what starts to happen? Yeah. So Not if, to put you on the spot, but if no, you have well, any because well, I'd it, love to make this It gets so, so, so uncomfortable and horrible because there's, there's so much unsaid. Yes, the it's starting down of the ceiling underneath. <laughs> exactly. It starts to build up. Yeah. We keep thinking, oh, it's a small thing, you know, I'll overlook it. And pretty soon we are overlooking so many small things, right? That stuff builds and builds and builds. And people also say things about, well, things never change because we've never bothered to speak up about any of it. And so it just all keeps going and stays the same. Um, then there's, you know, there's a greater risk of exploding because the interesting secret of a lot of, and that's not a secret, but one of the interesting insights of a lot of anger management programs is that the people who tend to have the hardest time with anger, anger management are the people who don't have good boundaries. So they're, they're allowing themselves to, you know, we are allowing ourselves to, to put it in our, until then one day we're like, ah, I can't do it anymore. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of risks. And so then we start looking at the other side of it. Well, so what are the positives of engaging in conflict? Mm -hmm. Right? And yeah, well, I get to I guess you get to say the stuff that's been bugging you. Yeah. You get to you get to put that out on the table and, and you, you know, can. particularly mm -hmm. if it's facilitated. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. You talk with that and you get someone to hold the space and yeah. Yeah, you get to put it out on the table, and if you have enough support to keep it safe, things might actually get better. It's like we might be able to work through it. We might be able to get to the other side of it. Um, new ideas come up. You know, change might happen, all these kinds of things. And then we go back to the down to the last quadrant. What are the risks of engaging in conflict? Right? Yeah. I guess it, it, I go immediately back to the irrepar irreparable damage again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we might end up in a war, right? Yeah. It's like the conflict builds up. There's people get somebody does something really foolish and then another person feels like they need to strike back. It's like it's a very real danger. Yeah. And so after we do this exercise with the group, I feel like we are all in a much more respectful place with regard to conflict mm. you know we recognize its value and at the same time we recognize the risks inherent in conflict so we have more compassion for our conflict avoidant parts and we also have maybe more compassion for people who feel or the parts of us who feel like you know darn it i can't stand the status quo anymore i need to go out there and disrupt because if i just go along and go along and go along, nothing's going to ever change here. So then the question comes, how do we how do we engage in conflict in a way that allows things to not be so dud, dull and dead and stultifying because our whole culture is focused on like how to suppress conflict? Without, on the other hand, end up causing irreparable harm, right? So, yeah. So that's a bit about about mm -hmm. how I, I like to frame the whole adventure of exploring conflict. How do we make it a safe adventure? Yeah. One of the things that struck me that several people I've spoken to so far have, have highlighted is that... Um, that kind of moment or, or, or sometimes longer than a moment of sitting in the fire, of, of sitting with the kind of the point at which it feels like this just isn't going to work. Um, that I think that I think happens in kind of like when we're in full conflict, when, the, when we have, you know, we've kind of got it all out on the table, but the resolution bit hasn't really kicked in and that holding 
um, and and being, you know, having the confidence and the courage to just allow that to take the time that it takes. Is that something that comes up in the work that that you do, or or do you yeah. have other ways of managing that? I'm really interested in training wheels. I'm mm-hmm. really interested in in scaffolding. I'm really interested in how can we make this process as doable as possible so that we don't all have to be Zen masters in order to end up with a livable world. Yeah. I mean, it's a great thing to become a Zen master, but I get a little despairing when I feel like our recipe for global transformation is that it all depends upon each person becoming enlightened as soon as possible. I, I, I think it's a yes and, right? Yes, we each need to do that journey of doing our own inner work so that we can sit in the fire. Absolutely. And what can we offer that makes it more doable for people? Yeah, it, it does feel like, I, I think that is that goes to the heart of one of the kind of really big questions I have, you know, <laughs> late at night. Um, around the fact that you know we all have trauma we all have have yeah. experiences yeah. that we weren't able to cope with and that yeah. we haven't integrated and yeah. that actually it could take us years yeah. to be able to integrate and yet we need to make a better world yeah exactly <laughs> you know, we, so we're not so the for me, we might be one day <laughs> so for me i really drive enormous inspiration from a story that i'm sure you've read in one form or another that one about the difference between heaven and hell Oh yes, the one with you the know spoon. those those beings with the very long necks and the very long spoons, and it makes it very hard in hell when they're trying to feed themselves, right? Yeah. And then you go to heaven, and it's the exact same thing: the the same long necks, the same long spoons, except that they've figured out how to feed each other, mm. and so they're all getting fed, right? Yeah. So I think that it's it's a real problem because I think that. Oh, gosh, I was way deep into the Buddhist world for a period of time, and I I gained a lot from it and grew a lot from it. It was tremendously valuable. And um, I also have a pretty strong critique of it, you know, in some ways, which is that, especially in the West, it's like we've imported the aspects of Eastern Buddhist practice that really fit in with our individualism and that fit in with our... Some people, I did not coin this, but, and I don't remember who it was who said spiritual athleticism, right? It's like, we're each going to, you know, sit on our cushion for hours and hours and hours until we become enlightened. And, and, and half the world doesn't have the time to do that to begin with, but, but also it's so effing individualistic. And yes, taking care of our own body, mind, heart is our sacred responsibility. We can't expect anybody else to do that for us. We are entrusted with that. And at the same time, how can we set up structures so that if I'm triggered and if you're triggered, our dear friend who isn't triggered right now can say, hey, I can listen to each of you for a moment and help you feel heard. And then we can each settle back down into our social engagement system. And then we can easily work things out. Mm -hmm. And likewise, each of us can do that holding space for somebody else who happens to be in a momentary state of of trigger, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the big, huge things we need to do in order to, to get there is to really destigmatize the fact that as human beings we get triggered. Yeah. And yes, someday, you know, we'll be so enlightened that we won't get triggered anymore. But until then, we're human. Mm-hmm. Right? And being triggered is part of being human. Mm-hmm. So how do we design conflict systems that help us all reach a space of better understanding whenever a couple of us have started to get triggered because here's the thing about a conflict system. A couple of people start getting triggered and the very first thing that people will tend to do is to want to line up sides. You know, it's like, oh, here's the person over there. And so, well, I want you to be on my side. No, I want, you know, and pretty soon we have a whole polarized field, right? Rather than 
one of the people whose work I really admired, I told you earlier, I really want to, um, there's a lot of people whose work I want to, um, you know, lift up here. So Dominic Barter's Restorative Circles work. I don't know if that's one of the people that you'll, that you'll, that you'll feature, but it's like, it, it's a community. It's a circle who comes and holds the space for transforming whatever conflict has happened, right? So in both cases, there's a community. It's just, do we have a community of people who are lining up behind two figures in a conflict in a polarized way? Or do we have a community that's coming to, together in support to hold the space for more understanding mm. and grow? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I so see that. And I'm really aware of, you know, how, how it's not part of public discourse at the moment that not only you know are you know we don't even talk about the kind of um trauma of the people where it's most obvious like for instance i saw a beautiful video uh, about an american project recently um uh, it may have been called step into the circle or that may have just been their exercise mm -hmm. but they were they were playing this big game with guys in prison saying step oh, yes. into the circle if you've yes you know, if you've been treated without respect. Yeah. And people yeah. were both stepping themselves and owning up to awful things that had happened to them growing up and also seeing other people doing that. Um, and then they processed that afterwards. And, and the observation of the person who's leading that was, these are our most traumatized people and we're putting them in jail and punishing them. And we're not working, you know, therapeutically. Yeah. So we don't even talk about, really, about, the trauma at that level, you know, people yeah. who just are, are completely unable to contain their trauma, let alone, you know, people who who can hold it together and look like they're having a kind of normal life, but actually in lots of situations and are, are, are either miserable or making other people miserable because their trauma's, you know, being triggered and, and hanging out there. Yeah. We all have, we all have... Yeah, we all have unhealed trauma. We have different yeah. amounts of it, different kinds of it, different flavors of it or whatever, but we all have unhealed trauma. And you're absolutely right. It's not something that tends to be, it's starting to more. There's more and more trauma-informed schools and trauma-informed programs and that. And it's super important work that's happening around all this. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you were saying there were a few other sort of ways of working or, or approaches that you really wanted to kind of um, highlight yeah so, so what, what else is there one of the one of the first kind of underlying patterns um that I think is really important is this whole thing about what happens when we feel heard and gotten mm -hmm. there's a wonderful woman uh, Barbara Fredrickson, who's a positive psychology researcher, who wrote a book called Love 2.0, which is a general audience work. She's written a lot of scientific papers. This is a general audience work. And she talks about how in her research, so positive psychologists are people who study, you know, meditators and what is the physiology of joy and just all of the positive emotions, like, like what brings them on, how they affect their bodies, et cetera. And so, when she's worked with people who are, you know, hooked up in the laboratory with whatever kind of sensors they use to learn all these things, one of the things that she's found is that one of the most powerful emotions for human beings is feeling gotten by another person, feeling heard, feeling understood. And so she developed this, uh, this theory. She talks about micro moments of connection. And so the reason she wrote the book is she said it shifted her whole idea of what love is, right? Like in our culture, we think, you know, oh, romance or, you know, boy meets girl or then, you know, altruism or, 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 you know, long marriage or whatever. And she's saying that whether we're married or not, whether we're single, whether we have a partner, the frequency in our lives of micro moments of connection, feeling seen and understood by another human being is one of the greatest impacts, just even on our own physical health, mm. right? So um, in the second half of her book, she has this wonderful, beautiful 
instruction on metta practice, which actually happens to be my favorite Buddhist practice. I love metta practice, but I was puzzled because it's like we're talking about feeling seen and heard by another person. Why did she not bring in a connection practice, right? So the connection practice that I actually want to really promote um, is the work of um, empathy circles. Um, Edwin Rutsch. Um, and it's a very, very simple basic format, but it's a it's a practice where we spend time in a small circle taking turns speaking and taking turns listening and reflecting back what we've heard so that the person who is speaking feels deeply heard. And then the listener becomes the next speaker and another listener is reflecting back. So I just want to mention this, um, you know, people, empathy is becoming a huge thing in our culture. There's books and books and books that are written um, on empathy. But I just want to say that the, the kind of empathy that we're talking about in empathy circles is a relational practice. It's, they're not talking about individual constructs or something that you either have or you don't. We're talking about a practice of to what extent are we developing the habit of helping another person feel heard and understood before jumping in with whatever else we may have to say, right? Mm -hmm. So I just think it's so important because we live in a culture that is built on the artificial creation of scarcity mm -hmm. and that is designs competition, right? It's like those who climb to the top are the only ones who are going to have the right to live, breathe, and get good health care here in the U.S. You guys are way more enlightened than we are. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so it's like, but, but even though those are economic things, they don't just affect our economic system. They've percolated into how we deal with interhuman attention, right? Mm -hmm. So often in situations, people are competing with each other for who's going to get airtime and who's going to get heard and, and, and like that. And so, Having a conversational practice where we are feeding one another with those spoons, right? And that's what it's about. I would love for Dr. Fredrickson to someday hook people up to those little monitors and test the brainwaves of people who are doing empathy circles. Because my experience and that of many other people is that it creates a level of deep realization that in our culture, we're simply not used to being in group environments where there's that degree of safety. I mean, as you think about groups, you think about the workplace, you know, it's usually hierarchically structured. Blah, blah, blah. Who's going to, you know, get a raise? Who's going to get promoted? Who's going to get fired? Blah, blah, blah. Schools, right? We're all competing for grades and blah, blah, blah. So it's a very different experience and it's very simple. It's so simple. Like you might read about it and laugh and say, Oh, you know, we've known about active listening for years and you know, so mm -hmm. what's the big deal, but to actually do it um, can really help us experience a different, different state of being. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me um, what you said. It, it wasn't, it wasn't an empathy circle, but it was a, uh, a, a circle where we were, discussing trauma and we were also periodically uh doing exercises to ground ourselves and come back into yeah. our bodies yeah. and i had such a stark experience of we've been put into small groups to have a conversation and then we had to feed back to the big group and we were doing that thing of like oh no i don't want to do it you do it and and for me at the end of our small group there was an absolute no there was no way I was going to feedback from our group a complex, um, you know, conversation that had been very wide ranging and that I felt I couldn't do justice to, to a large group of people I didn't know. There was just a, a flat no. And then we did a grounding exercise and a kind of getting back into our bodies. And we sat back in the circle and I thought, I have no problem with feeding back. And it was wow. like night and day. It was like wow. all of a sudden I felt completely relaxed and able to do something yeah. which I had, yeah. you know, completely had a, a refusal wow. on a physical level. And that was to do with, yeah, just coming back into my body and yeah. knowing that everybody else in the room was doing mm -hmm. that too. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it was just that immediate comparison of my different yeah. states. Yeah. And, you know, if you if you translate that into a work environment, I had become, you know, 100% more productive <laughs> after yeah. that experience than I had yeah. before. Yeah. I was able to perform where previously I hadn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's really, uh, really telling. That's fascinating. Um, by any chance, was the group you were in some of Sarah Payton's work? Well, I... Hmm. Sorry about that. Because um, she's another know. person whose work I love. Sarah oh, Payton yeah. is just, oh my gosh. Yeah, she does amazing work with helping people understand the brain and, and in real practical ways. And how do we make those shifts? And so she's she's another person. It, it I may well have been inspired by uh -huh, uh -huh. something that she brings. I don't know. And then when you shared the bit about the difference that that would make in the workplace. Mm. Right. Being able to shift from that space of feeling, you know, anxious, like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to try and see anything to being in a much more grounded space. It's like, oh, sure. Um, another of my heroes is Dr. Amy Edmondson, who has done a lot of work on the importance of psychological safety in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And she has some wonder, wonder, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, TED Talks on that. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that whole thing about the difference that it makes to people being able to speak their truth. And so in her TED Talks, she's talking about, you know, you're a nurse and you've noticed a potential error in medication, but the last time you said something, you got sharply shamed by the doctor and you don't speak up about something that you've seen because you, you start to doubt yourself and you're not sure that it's worth the hassle, right? Right. So there can be enormous consequences to those cultures of intimidation and scarcity and competition and all of that, yeah. Absolutely crucial, yeah. I was actually talking to somebody just this morning um, who was relating his experience of new management being brought into the local university, but also talking about friends' perspectives who've been working in the local authority, in a local bus company um, and in the, the National Health Service. So uh, the, around about the same time, there was this shift of management um, and it was, it was associated with um, moving towards becoming much more interested in making money. Um, but, but the management became very, very top down and very bullying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also kind of from the external. So they didn't want people who had come up through the workforce and had kind of understood the way things work, it was imp sort of imposed from the outside people managers. And he said, well, those people managers are just professional bullies. Um, and they, they're not supposed to have a connection with the work that goes on in the plant. Um, so it's kind of like in, a, in the opposite. The in opposite. the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yet, you know, I guess, I guess that, that, because so, so any place where people can be supported to um, reconnect with that confidence and that and that yeah. sense of yes, no, it is it is good for you to say how it, how things are. For you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's really uh, helpful in, in situations like that. I, I know we have been saving a, a conversation about politics and the, how how this kind of all relates to this kind of broader scenario in which we live together and work together and take decisions together, um, which in both of our countries has become yeah. so toxic and yeah. polarized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have any kind of final answer for that, but I do have something that may oh. be of interest, right? <laughs> um, but before that, just want to rewind sure. for a, for for a sure. moment. You, you were saying, you know, your example was, management heading in the wrong direction and I just I just want to say oh my gosh I have a good friend Tom Antley who does really interesting work who one of his little quips that you know often gets repeated by his friends is he has a, um, a thing that he says about how things are getting better and better and worse and worse faster and faster all at the same time <laughs> and uh, you know so just even looking at 
the realm of energy, right? It's like we have these wonderful new solar energy panels that are 10 times more efficient than they were back in the day. And I've heard horrible things about the Michael Moore movie, but I haven't seen it myself. But anyway, apparently it's all very outdated data, whatever. Um, we have wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things happening. And at the same time, you know, we have some oil companies and gas companies that are going gangbusters with trying to use this crisis as an opportunity to drill on protected land. So, I mean, it's like, sometimes it seems like, oh, things are getting better and better. And then sometimes you look at some stuff and it's like, Wah. so, and it's all happening at the same time. So there's been a lot of wonderful experiments in participatory management in the business world for decades and decades and decades, you know, going back, you know, 100 years, 150 years, whatever. And then there are these, you know, very top down things that go on as though we didn't know that there were better ways of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's quite the paradox in so many areas. Yeah. yeah, so shall I jump into the politics? Please do, please do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I love to talk about this particular thing that I, I want to mention here because it's a, it's a really um, inspiring possibility. It's, it's not a fix-all, it's not a cure-all, but it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful little experiment that has taken off and is, is thriving and growing. And mm -hmm. it has to do with, you know, there's this whole area of uh, participatory democracy deliberative democracy, consultation, you have a lot more of it in the UK than we have in the US right now, although there are some wonderful experiments in the US as well. And um, But the ones that I'm most informed about, because they're the ones that use this process that I practice and teach, et cetera, of dynamic facilitation, are these um, civic councils that have been taking place in the state of Austria. And um, the, their actual name is Bürgerräte, and which means something like a civic council or citizens council or people's council. And they were inspired by the wisdom council model, which was created by Jim Roth, who's also the same person who created the dynamic facilitation work. Well, anyway, these people in Austria just really picked it up and ran with it, right? They had a very positive experience in their initial um, council that they gathered. It's a sortition-based process, which is one of the things that Extinction Rebellion is has as one of their demands right now, or the citizens' assemblies, which is a sortition-based process as well. This is a kind of a smaller scale sortition-based process, which is really important for some context, because you don't always have, you know, millions of dollars to spend in bringing together 150 people for five weekends and like that. So this is a kind of like a small scale version of that. And it's um, the the operating system or the engine under the hood or whatever is the dynamic facilitation process. And so working with a process that uses a lot of empathy to help people feel safe to and heard and gotten to share their perspectives on whatever public policy issue is being explored. Uh, people are able to do a whole lot in two days and come up with a consensus statement on what they feel the positive direction forward in this particular policy area is. And um, so they did one that was very successful. They did another. They did another. There's been over a hundred of these in this particular state in Austria, neighboring states, and it's spread to Germany as well. And so, as I said, it's it's like a citizens assembly, but it's it's a little bit more cost effective, and so a little bit more lean and agile. And uh, and we need different processes for different levels of scale because. Back to what you were saying earlier when we transitioned to this part, it's like you said something about, you know, this thing about decision making, which we're doing 
in our families and in our communities and in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces. And so things like the Wisdom Council and the Civic Council are models that can be used at a smaller level of scale. Um, because I feel really strongly we need to learn these skills of participatory collaborative decision making at every level of scale, right? And that also is the vision of Extinction Rebellion, which is one of the things I'm so excited about this movement, is, um, you know, having a, uh, having really, really, it's like democracy throughout at many, many levels of scale and, uh, and reinventing what the word democracy means because it's not, you know, we're so used to it means that we go and we vote for people who then are going to go and make all the elections themselves. But what if it's actually getting people together to actually come up with policy directives and to come up with, this is what the people want. Now you, the legislators and the administrators and all that, it's your job to implement it. It doesn't do away with the need to have some people who are doing that work full time, but the policy setting really needs to come from the people. And it's really possible for that to happen. That's my, that's my yeah. little. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that sortition, which I guess, you know, for, for anyone who's not come across it before is, is the idea that you, you make a kind of, a, a random representative sample of whichever population it is. So whether that's your city or your country or the world, even it's something that's you know XR has been yeah. talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. That you know you 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 make a random selection, but you're also making sure that you have you know equality of gender and mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. you know um, different social. Uh, sections are represented and sometimes you might um, adjust for trying to make sure if you know if it's something like climate change you might want you might see a really good reason for having a few more young people involved so you can kind of tweak that representative sample and what, what I've noticed in kind of watching um, videos of those processes um, is how seriously people take them I think people are so used to not being trusted and actually, you know, we, we're educated, you know, your education system is similar to ours. We're educated to um, defer responsibility. We, we, we expect to be told what to do by somebody else. Um, and it's extraordinary when you give people that responsibility it's there's something quite magical about just the way people's faces are when they're in those groups. They're really, really taking yes. their responsibility yes. seriously and they're, they're absolutely they're giving it all. They're really sort of talking and, and I guess that kind of you know that that setup around empathy, around people feeling really safe within those yeah. um, processes, um, you know, can really pay off. So people will listen, also listen to one another and not feel yeah. threatened by the fact that somebody thinks differently um strong framing is so important yes exactly exactly so these are facilitated processes which means that someone is there to help make sure that everybody gets heard right yeah. uh the word facilitation has gotten a really bad name in the business world uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it's called facipulation because too many people get hired by management who says, well, this is where we want the decision to end up. And now you go and do a feel good so that everybody feels they've been a part of it. Well, that's clearly unethical. And that was one of the first things I learned from Jim Roth, who was my first facilitation teacher is so, so, so it's a very serious responsibility that our job is not to try and get everybody to come up with some predetermined outcome. Our job is to really support everyone being heard and each and, and the group themselves being able to come up with the outcome that they want to uh, to achieve. And, and so you talked about framing. And so I want to go a little deeper here and say that, you know, sometimes it might be helpful to offer three possibilities so that people say, you know, well, they have these examples, but but I have a concern when there's processes where the whole process is 
pick which of these three you like, because then we are we are constraining. We're not just initially framing, but we are constraining the range of possibilities. So, for instance, there was a big participatory process here in the U.S. and California. Um, I don't recall the year. I, I would have to look it up, but I know it left a lot of bad taste in people's mouths because single payer option healthcare was intentionally not on the table and tabletop the facilitators were, were t- told to that if that comes up we're not going there so i mean what kind of public participation is that if you're constraining the already the input of what's considered acceptable or not you know so yeah there's there's a lot of ethics involved in this stuff because the thing is if you run public participation pro- processes that people then feel are sham then you you create additional distrust and then the next time you want to try and do something from a really good place you have to overcome all of the additional distrust that has been created by people doing that kind of stuff so there's there's a lot of real consequences to messing with people's trust yeah absolutely which which i guess is is kind of recalling for me your your um your comments about training wheels and scaffolding and you know the, the the kind of the the bits that you can put in that just help people cope and trust and feel heard and feel yeah. you know yeah. feel got all, all of those things which kind of um, minimize the the potential for conflict and mm-hmm. which relax people and you know when I think about the way that we're used to doing politics they're almost all not there <laughs> you know in the House of Commons. The, uh, you know, famously, the, the two benches are the length of a sword away from one another. Basically, the, you know, the whole structure of the room is to do with, you know, is, is gladiatorial. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. how are people supposed to think creatively uh, yeah. in a context where they, you know, it, it's almost mandatory that they get jumped on and shouted yeah. at and shouted yeah. down and... You know, it just feels like the yeah. whole the whole thing is is up for a up for an upgrade or two. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm so glad you came around to that because it it oh it's it's so much about the the underlying structures that need to be changed. I just want to bring up my little chart uh, yeah. one more time because when we finish that, one of the the questions that um, that I often ask people is you know so. What? How do you see the relationship between creativity and conflict? And people will often say, you know, things like, well, if there's a lot of ideas, and sometimes conflict produces a lot of ideas, like, like conflicting perspectives, people might get more creative. But if people feel attacked, then people don't get creative, people get defensive. And so so the question that all this builds up to, and I don't have it typed up on a, on a little thing here, but it's like, how can we maximize the diversity of perspectives while minimizing interpersonal anxiety? And so what I like to say is that dynamic facilitation is one answer to that. It's not the answer, but that's 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 the question that this practice aims to be an effective answer to, right? Yeah. Yes. That's really lovely and and yeah, I can see so much that 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 happens in people's everyday lives again that that that, that does the opposite. So there's a lot of energy that goes into creating anxiety um, and to putting us in a situation where we're most likely to polarize, where we're most likely to feel attacked or frightened or threatened or, um, and so, and so, you know, and it adds to that, you know, picture you had right at the beginning yeah. of people kind of lining up behind mm-hmm. the, the, the two viewpoints instead of like, oh, let's just relax a little bit <laughs> and let's, you know, get into, get into a, a a connection with ourselves and and feel reassured that that we can find a way for us all to get our needs met and maybe we don't know that what that journey is going to look like yet but we yeah. we really believe it's possible absolutely absolutely and and you're so right that it it seems intentionally designed that way and i i think a lot of it actually is you know one of the oldest 
rules of politics is divide and conquer, you know, mm -hmm. so division amongst the people. And then, you know, the 1% can continue to, you know, and, and so, so how do we, how do we make those bridges? How do we do this work of learning to work creatively with conflicting perspectives, mm -hmm. uh, minimizing, maximizing the diversity of perspectives, but minimizing that interpersonal anxiety that comes from, from a, a model that's, you know, that, that we so much needs to be composted and transformed. Like to me, that's the key question. Because if the ninety nine percent of us were able to work creatively with the differences amongst ourselves, it's like we wouldn't need to worry about the one percent. We could like invite them to the table, say, "Hey, we figured it out. You guys can join us, or just you know do your own thing." But yeah, mm. yeah, and I, and I feel like some of the answer, you know, is is kind of. You know, one of the things that's really lovely about transition initiatives is one of the first things that they're encouraged to do is go around and speak to anyone who's doing anything in the community already. It's not to kind of set up and go, hey, we're doing this thing and it's, you know, it's the it's the new kid in town and it's better than what you're all doing. It's it's going in and having conversations with people already doing stuff and saying, you know, so what what is it that you're wanting to happen? And how does that align with what we're wanting to happen? So it's building relationship. And it feels like, you know, that, that a lot of our, our our progressive change efforts kind of happen quite in a quite a lonely way. You know, that there's not a lot of people doing that work of saying, okay, so, you know, Extinction Rebellion, what's, you know, what have you got in common with this homelessness project? Or what have you got in common with, uh, you know, people who are working on anti-racism? And I think there are people within Extinction mm -hmm. Rebellion who are trying to do that, that sewing across that relationship building and, and, and yeah. creating of shared agendas um, Indeed. Between, between movements and between people who are working mm -hmm. on good mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, I just want to put in a plug for um, Naomi Klein's book, mm -hmm. This Changes Everything. Like, mm -hmm. she has a long, detailed chapter at, toward, toward the end where she's talking about an experience of doing that in mm -hmm. Canada, where all these different mm -hmm. movements came together, you know, for days looking at how can we actually build a broader coalition amongst us. And so, part of what I think is so important about change is to, is to just highlight these positive examples like, oh, wow, this happened here. Maybe it can happen here too, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's really appreciating those, um, you know, so people talk about appreciative inquiry. People also talk about positive deviance, you know? It's like there's this one place that has figured out how to do this. Let's see if we can learn more about it so that it can spread. Yeah. yeah. That is playing with some. Those those positive viruses. Yes, positive viruses. <laughs> Spreading the positive viruses, indeed. Yeah. Wow. Yes, I think that's I think that's probably about our time up. And what a lovely conversation. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank it's you really, so much. Really lovely to spend this time. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm. Well.